everything falls under the umbrella for me of being wild. And here's my definition of wild. Wild is who you are at your core. It's not something you have to fix or improve or make better. It's underneath the roles you play in your work or in your personal life. It's just you, beautiful, messy, natural you. So being wild means having the courage to bring the gift of all of who you are to all of what you do. This podcast is sponsored by Engineered Tax Services, a subsidiary of Engineered Advisory, whose goal is to support CPAs and their clients to achieve the highest and best use of time and resources. ETS offers specialty tax services and incentives, which help expand your capabilities and ensure that your clients are paying only what is required in taxes and nothing more. To learn more about Engineered Tax Services, go to engineeredtaxservices.com and mention the Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise podcast to receive project discounts and a free CPA partnership ebook. Hi, everyone. This is Heidi Henderson, and you are listening to the Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise podcast for accountants. I am really passionate about people and the industry. And I truly believe that the accounting industry can do better for both our clients and its professionals. So I'm going to share insights from people who have found professional success and who have managed to balance that with their physical, mental, and personal health. So I hope you enjoy, and I hope you get inspired. Accountants can earn free CPE from listening to this episode. Just visit earmarkcpe.com, download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. And now, on to the episode. Hi, everyone. This is Heidi Henderson with Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise. And today, we have Chris Heater of the Wild Institute with us. And I've been so excited to talk with Chris. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her, and then I'll tell you about how I uh, I actually met her at a conference where she was speaking. But to give you a little bit of her background, Chris is a wilderness guide, a professional speaker, a dog musher, and a poet. What an amazing combination of, of uh, expertise. Uh, she is taking what she's learned in wild places and applying it to the wilderness of work. And that's, those are kind of her words. She's been guiding canoe and dog sled trips since 1983. She was featured on the Discovery Channel's National Geographic Today, founding the Wild Institute in 2000, and she's been speaking since 2001. She has several awards along the way, and Chris has made this correlation about a team of sled dogs with all of their quirks and their personalities and just realizing that it isn't that different than a team of humans who are all pulling in the same direction, working with each individual to maximize their potential, the communication, the leadership, diversity, culture, teamwork. It's all in the dog yard. Again, that, those are her words. And I absolutely love how she's created this correlation. She ties it over to the accounting space by saying in a field that makes a lot of assumptions about how you are supposed to be, the dog sled or the, the sled dogs show the value of being yourself and the gifts that each unique individual can bring. So taking care of that wild self is also part of the dog yard. Pacing, taking time alone in your dog house, the power of play and movement. And again, again, Chris's words, it's all right there. So I ran into Chris because she was the keynote speaker at an international CPA association that I attended earlier uh, in 2022. And everyone loved what she had to bring to the table. It was so unique and so different than anything else I've seen at so many conferences that I've attended through my career. And I have to mention that one of the coolest things I think everybody felt is that she also brought a dog with her. <laughs> We're all in this big conference room, and everyone was so excited that they got to see and pet Summit as she was walking him around while she was speaking, um, among other things. It was so neat to hear her message. So with that, Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. I can't wait for our conversation. Oh, me too. Thanks, Heidi. <laughs> Absolutely. As, as soon as you said Summit's name, he's taking watching himself. So you may hear him in the background, but that's just part of being real here. <laughs> 
I love that. I was going to ask you when we got on the line if Summit was there because it was so fun having the opportunity to meet and uh, and he was so gracious to let so many people put their hands all over him and uh, it was fun to see everybody's faces light up. So my first question for you is with your series of, of backgrounds and the wilderness and the exposure that you've had in your lifetime, what in the world brought you or crossed you over into public speaking? <laughs> Well, I'd been guiding trips already for a long time, and I knew from experience you can't make a living doing only that. But I wasn't done yet. So the places I was guiding, I was doing all sorts of other odd jobs, but the places I was guiding kind of stopped, and I just wasn't done yet. So I just sat down and thought, what, what could I combine? And the times I'd had opportunities to speak in the past, it seemed to go pretty well. So honestly, that's it. I just thought, well, I need another leg of the stool. So maybe I'll just try speaking. Yep. And the amazing way the universe works is that I had made that I just like the day before had decided, well, maybe I'll try speaking, not knowing anything about that. And then the next day I was already set to be at a Women Business Owners Association luncheon to talk about my trips. And I got seated next to someone. She said, what do you do? I said, I guide trips. And now I'm thinking about being a speaker. And she said, oh, I'm a speaker. And we just developed an apprentice program. It starts next week. You should join. And that's how oh. the world works, I think, when you're open and try to pay attention as best you can. Stuff like that opens up when you're, when you're watching for it. So I indeed attended it. And it was a nine-month course that didn't teach you how to speak, but it taught the business of speaking, the industry side. So that's how I got into it. Oh. Okay. Wow. I mean, it's so serendipitous. I had this conversation with a friend yesterday about how when we start to think about something, it's amazing what kind of comes our way. Yeah, and so to, to tie that back to you, and I think why your message, and, and I do want to get into your message a little bit more as well, but uh, I was excited to just ask you some of these questions first. But I think it resonated a lot with me because I'm an animal person. I have three dogs. I've had dogs my whole life. Uh, my, my son's a skier, professional skier. Um, we've always been very outdoorsy and I discovered ski joring years ago. Yeah, so nice. I, I cross country ski with my Husky who pulls me with a harness and it is the most wonderful, glorious thing. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't even tell you how much I love that. Um, but the other thing that I do is I ride and train horses. And for me personally, that side of me is so completely separate from my professional career mm. in tax consulting and accounting and all these things. But it's a, so, such a huge part of who I am because of what I have learned from my animals and what, what I've seen from the dynamic and the relationship that you have to have, especially having multiple animals with this balance between trust and respect and how that all blends together. And as I've gotten older, I've always thought, how, how can this pull together somehow to blend into the professional world? And you somehow managed to do that. And I, again, I think that's why it hit home so much with me and how your message just was like, boom, there it is. That's that, you know, she has managed to put this message together about the dynamics of the animal kingdom, so to speak, and how the dynamics of a pack work and how much we can learn from that as people because we aren't that different. So so that's what really hit with me. So dive into that a little bit. Tell us more about this message you've created and when it all started coming together for you in terms of this working with sled dogs and how this was beginning to tie over to people. Sure. Well, I would submit, Heidi, that it does cross over even for you. If you work with horses or you're ski joring with your husky, what you're learning about patience and communication, all that, there's no question in my mind that that translates. I just decided to put words to it because I think any of us who interact mm -hmm. with animals, have, it's just a different way of being and you can't use your words in the same way. And so we have to listen differently and communicate differently. So all that I'm quite sure would show up for you in your work as well. Um, so where it came up for me, let me think, just so many years of working with the dogs and recognizing some of the stuff I was saying just was right there. It completely applied whether I was working with a dog or a human. So I think really, I just, I live in the world of metaphor and analogy. 
that's probably the poet side of me. So it was pretty <laughs> easy to start tying that together. And I would guess actually early on, I guided a lot of whitewater canoeing. And I've created a whole mm. speaking speaking program about that too, that takes navigating whitewater the same way you might apply it to work um, in terms of communication. And, and it's because things would come up, like I would say to someone who was trying to practice their ferry. So you're in, a, in rapids and you can go sideways around rocks instead of bashing into them. So I was teaching her and they were practicing where there weren't rocks and I could barely stay behind her. And I said, you know, I think you got it. You're doing really well. I can barely hold still as much as you are. And she says, no, I don't, I don't feel like I have it yet. I don't have enough control. And I said to her, the amount of control you're seeking is unattainable. And she threw her hands in the air. She goes, oh, my gosh, the story of my life. <laughs> and I just realized <laughs> things like that are what started tying it back and forth for me. And then just like you said, animals are such incredible teachers that um, it, it just, the more you look, the more you will see those kind of comparisons. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So talk a little bit about this message, this you created the Wild Institute. And what what is it that you feel like you're sharing with people that seems to hit home the most? I would say no matter what I'm doing, whether I'm guiding trips or speaking or writing or training, whatever, everything falls under the umbrella for me of being wild. And here's my definition of wild. Wild is who you are at your core. It's not something you have to fix or improve or make better. It's underneath the roles you play in your work or in your personal life. It's just you, beautiful, messy, natural you. So being wild means having the courage to bring the gift of all of who you are to all of what you do. And that for me kind of sums up everything I speak about or what I do is to try to have all of us step a little closer to ourselves and not be pretzeling ourselves, spending all this energy doing or trying to be something we're not. And that fits no matter what the topic is, whether we're talking about leadership or teamwork or even att attracting and retaining employees, any of that really comes down to can we show up our true wild selves and then truly welcome that in another? Yeah, that's a huge message. And I think one thing you had talked about, and to that point, um, is in the professional space, there has always been this long-standing persona that we need to be professionals. Yes. And that sort of professional stigma oftentimes creates uh, a wall between who we are as individuals versus who we are as professionals. And so I think you had said something, I don't remember the term you used, but be wildly something. Uh -huh. And it was about being willing to just be okay with being you and allowing that to open up into professional relationships. Absolutely. My premise is that there are three essentials. Three essentials, mm -hmm. and that would be to be wildly present, wildly original, and wildly welcoming. So it all has to start with presence. If we're mm -hmm. distracted, thinking about other things, not fully paying attention, then none of this is going to work. So you got to start there. Wildly original is living your wild story. This is the part you're referencing, which is to have the courage to be you. That's why my definition of wild is having the courage to bring the gift of all of who you are to all of what you do, because it is courageous. It's much easier, not comfortable, but easier to hide behind whatever persona we may think we need to put out to show up the way we think an accountant, for example, should be. But the cost of that is high if it doesn't exactly line up with who you are. Wildly welcoming, then, is embracing another's wildness. So I really think, though, what, what you're asking and what's such a crucial point in business is somehow the thought that if I am less than this professional persona, then somehow that's bad for business. And I just, I refuse to believe that. I think any interaction I've had, especially in the financial industry, where it's already comes loaded with all of us come to with our shame and our worries and money's just this crazy, confusing, hard thing, right? And anytime someone was willing to show a little bit about who they truly were, it was like, oh, there's a connection here. It's a relief to feel a connection because mm -hmm. we come to you assuming judgment. Not that you necessarily judge people, but all most people are going to come to money from a place of judgment, feeling like we're doing it wrong, we're not doing good enough. And it's an invitation on your end of, this, of the interaction 
to just be you so that I can relate to something and feel some true connection. And then you'll get a more honest response probably about how it's really going. And then you're off and running. I think part of being a CPA or an accountant, especially is you've got to be strong technically and relationally. And that's a whole big skill set to have to manage. So on top of that, trying to put on a persona or act in a certain way that may or may not fit you is just one too many things to try to hold, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and your perspective of sharing it from a client standpoint of coming in and feeling like you know, we're assuming judgment right off the get-go and that there's a bit of vulnerability. Well, I mean, whenever we deal with money, I think we all feel extremely yeah. vulnerable. <laughs> we open up that side of us. Right. Um, and, and, you know, <laughs> and the industry is very, very technical. Uh, it's very difficult for people to understand. And, you know, I deal with that a lot of time with clients where they're saying, I am so sorry, you know, can you explain that? Or I'm having a hard time right. understanding it. And I'm like, don't feel sorry at all. You know, this is what I've spent all my time focusing on, but mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I don't understand your business and that's what you're amazing at. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how you've been able to put that into words and share that message with your being present, original, and welcoming. Um, would you share a story about your your pack? Um, and and I'm sure you have many many stories, but share a story about the dogs and how you sort of started to see that there and tie it over to um, to people. Sure, it's hard to pick. Let's see. <laughs> I think I should tell you about probably Kita. I think we can all relate to Kita. He was a dog that came to cool. us through many, um, he had many homes before he came to us and we got a phone call that's not unusual. Someone will call if you have a dog team and say, you know, he seems to love to run and we're thinking he'd make a great addition to your team and we we're hoping you'd come get him today. So <laughs> we went and got oh. Kita. I mean, it was not an obvious choice. He was an adult, some kind of husky mix, but He'd never pulled a sled before, and it's not like he can sit in the dog yard and watch another dog team go by and somehow connect that he's going to go do that now. It's not how dog brains work. So you work with them one-on-one, -on -one, individually. Mm -hmm. And you try to help, like you're doing with ski joring, same thing. Have him pull with you on skis or work one-on-one. -on -one. But there will come a day when you need to hook him up with the team. And they've never done that before. If they're raised in a dog yard, that's different. But here's an adult dog coming onto the scene. So you hook them up with a couple slower, older dogs, and you just have to do it. I mean, there's not, a, there's no other way when you get to a certain point. And that very first time, you, the other dogs you've hooked them up with, they can't wait to go. So as soon as you pull what's called the quick release, the front dogs take off running, and the new guy doesn't know what's happening, probably gets jerked for a second by his collar, and then starts to run kind of because he has to, and then you go. And to be perfectly honest, sometimes they might get drug off their feet for just a second because the other dogs are running and then they scramble up and run. So like I said, there's nothing else you can do. So that's the idea. We get you know, hooked up with our two slowest, oldest guys. I pulled a quick release and Keita just stayed on his back and got drugged down the trail. <laughs> so... <laughs> I stopped the sled. I stood him up. I ruffled his ears. I said, you just didn't see that coming. Here we go, buddy. And I get back and we take off again. And he continued to get just drug on his back. So what do you do with that on a team? Two legs, four legs. What do you do when someone is just not getting it? He did figure out how to stay on his feet. He learned how to run fast enough to not get bumped by the sled, but slow enough to not actually be pulling anything. And when oh. I get to that part, you begin, everyone now listening is picturing someone that they either work with or know, or maybe it's a kid sometimes, whatever, but we all encounter someone who's just not pulling their weight. And what do you do with that on a team? So mm -hmm. with Kita, it's very frustrating. And then time came around where I, I don't know if you mentioned, but I, I, um, he, I penned him with a, I'm sorry, let me start over. I penned him with a dog that couldn't get along with anybody. And every single dog we tried, they would get into little fights. And I put Kita in with this dog named Mazel, and they got along great. And my whole dog yard is calmer. And important to note that no other dog on my team could be with him, only Kita. So that counts for something. The other thing is I teach dog sledding. I take people who've never done it before, and you come out off the grid for four days, and you learn how. And among the things you need to learn is harnessing. 
And we used to teach you harnessing mm. with a little stuffed animal dog. And we'd show you how to do it, but it doesn't translate. It's a little tiny stuffed animal. And then to have you go out to the dog yard with 40 screaming dogs, and it doesn't relate, it doesn't translate so well. And as it turns out, Kita is a perfect demo dog because he doesn't mind standing there. He doesn't want to pull, but he'll stand there and you can practice putting it on him and take it off. The next person can try it and he will stand there. Now, if you did that with a sled dog that loved to run, once the harness is on, that means they get to go. And if you took it off without the running part, they'd be quite upset. So once again, Kita is doing something for my team that no one else on my team can do. So the relation back to people is the great reminder from Kita that everybody has gifts. And before we write somebody off, we might get to know them a little bit better and make a few adjustments. And pretty soon they're doing something that really works in a way they bring a different perspective. They bring things that we wouldn't see from our standpoint. So yeah, he drives me crazy. He always will. Mm -hmm. But he is also my reminder that everybody has gifts. So that's usually what I do is I'll have a, a wow. million stories about dogs and then kind of how that ties back, particularly to the workplace. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I love that story. I was, I was speaking at a conference earlier this summer and someone asked me, it was about having difficult conversations. And someone asked me the question, what if you have someone who doesn't fit the mold or they're just not, you know, they're not doing what you need them to do? Can people change? Can you mm. encourage them or mentor them or train them into change? And my response to that was, you know, it's a difficult, it's a difficult question because people absolutely can learn and grow and evolve 100%. But to your point, there are also instances where if we truly get to understand what is driving that individual or in the case that dog, we can also look at how then to sort of transfer or translate what is meaningful to them into something that can be productive to the overall team. Instead of just dragging the team down, oftentimes Absolutely. repurpose that into something else. Absolutely. Um, and so often we want to write people off if they don't fit into our box. Yeah. And I would, my response to that would be, sure, people can change, including us. As long as we're putting it all on one side mm -hmm. of an equation that that one person needs to change to fit our mold, for one thing, that firm or whoever is not is not going to make it because if you keep hiring people that look and act just like you, you will get the same results, uh, which doesn't work in a oh. in a marketplace that needs to keep growing and changing and embracing and including. So, Kitas are just great reminders that okay, if we're both willing to flex and look, and if we're both willing to show up wild, we'll find the little mm -hmm. fits, the ways in which it's often just a small adjustment, and then that person's off and running. As opposed to firing and uh -huh. trying to hire someone. I mean, that is just a painful, painful loop. So that's my that would be my suggestion mm -hmm. really is that we both change, not just expect one half of an interaction to change. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So so then give us a give us a scenario where you then have the perfect team. You you end up with all these dogs that you've built, you've trained over time. I'm guessing that they have all of their different roles in that team. I don't know how many dogs are on a particular sled, but but what does that look like? Once you've developed that, how does that team then function and operate? Hmm. Well, since we guide trips, that means we take rookies out all the time. Um, you're always with one of the mushers on the team, but you're, the dogs are pulling people who are not used to this, who will be driving some of the time. And so what we're looking for might, mm. is really different than, a, say, a racing team might be. We want dogs who are patient, who listen really carefully, who are really well-trained and are a little bit more intuitive, that kind of thing, than just running like crazy as fast as they can. So we, because of that, we train all as many dogs as we can to be able to run every position on the team from lead, which is the front, to wheel, which is the very back, and all the positions in the middle. So they can flex. So my perfect team would be a dog full of lead dogs that anytime one of them's flagging or they just, oh, they ran lead all day today, let's switch them out, is to be able to fill in for each other and support each other. And it started to sound like a human team to me as I'm describing this team who they love to run. So we're pulling in the same direction and they're all um, into it. And then my job becomes mm -hmm. interesting, right? If I'm ultimately the leader on the team, I'm the musher. My job on a run is actually to be behind them 
not out front dragging the team, making being the being the leader in that regard. My job is to actually stand behind them and guide them so they can do their work, which I think is that's what I would call wild leadership or servant leadership. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that correlation I think is interesting too, to 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 picture, visualize a team where they all can be leaders because even when I ask that question and I'm thinking about it in my mind, I'm imagining a team where you've got your head dog and then you have the ones that are always going to follow that head dog and those personalities. And I think in the workplace, we tend to have that as well. You're going to have your leaders and then you're going to have, you know, other people that are like, okay, just tell me what to do. And they will be taskmasters, so to speak. But from what you're saying, it sounds like you, you know, a team in, in what you're doing works better and functions better is if they all have the ability to lead and work together as peers rather than having that tiered structure. And within is that, what that you're saying? a little bit within that, some of my dogs will never run lead. They don't like it. And you know that because you put them in lead mm-hmm. and they look behind them the whole time. They feel like they're being chased, you know? <laughs> so great. That's wonderful. We know that we will put you in the back where you will pull your heart out and that's lovely. So they don't all have to lead. But it's more knowing what their yeah. roles are, and because of the way, because of guiding, I need them to be able to switch on the fly. So not all of them, but the ones who are willing and have that skill set, absolutely, I want to have some flex there, some ability to shift, some ease, some flexibility, some extra room to do what we need to do. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's so that's fascinating. I I, I think it would be incredible to come out and do that. <laughs> well, <you laughs> Try some sled dog racing. <laughs> I might have to. That sounds amazing. Um, so, so in terms of developing the overall message, so you said that you you met this person who actually helped you kind of learn the business of speaking. How did you then start to formulate the message? Because again, your message is really laid out beautifully, and you've got these three components. You know, be wildly present, be wildly original, and wildly welcoming and tying that all back to your stories with the animals. Was this something that you sat down and created, or you just literally been evolving this over 20 years, and every time you speak, it it gets tweaked a little? Definitely the latter. I, I don't know if you're supposed to, you're probably not supposed to do this as a speaker, but I feel like I learn as much when I'm speaking as the people that are in the audience, because to me, it's almost a dance. Ooh. Um, one of my favorite poets is David White, and he said that the best speech is half what you plan to say and half what is listened out of you. And I really resonate with that because it's about the energy in the room. It's about what I'm seeing, where people are really nodding, and I'll go further on that topic than I thought. So it really is a, I've done it long enough that I'm comfortable doing it that way, where I can shift in the moment and try to really respond to what I'm noticing with the group. And that's that's joy. You know, it's sort of like guiding a trip. It's not really that different when you're just out there kind of thinking on your feet and really observing carefully. So the correlations came over time by telling stories and watching what people were really nodding to. And eventually it sort of formed the stories for me. And the and uh, I learned about speaking by speaking. And any speakers listening now are cringing because you're not supposed to do that. But it just is sort of how I <laughs> how I evolved from the very beginning yeah. stages when I thought all I could speak about was life balance because as I was, I was a wilderness guide. So what else would I know except how to have people take breaks? And then slowly people kept saying, corporate needs you, Chris. I'm like, I've never set foot in corporate America. I don't think that's true. And they <laughs> said, that's why they need you. And I finally yep. evolved enough to recognize that an outside perspective could be pretty useful. So me and the dogs and the whitewater stories have all kind of carried on into all sorts of settings. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's why, no pun intended, it was a complete breath of fresh air <laughs> to have you in a, in a conference setting like that. You know, again, I, I go to a lot of conferences and sit in a lot of inside sessions and, you know, to, to hear the message was refreshing. And then it was interesting because when you were talking about being original and, and vulnerability with realizing that as professionals, we can be professionals, we can also be very real and be okay with who we are. The whole rest of the conference, so, so you did the keynote that really kicked off this whole three, three and a half day conference. It was amazing because every conversation I had over the next three days, I felt that people were more open, more vulnerable, and more 
honest about who they were as individuals than any other time I had been there. And this is a conference that I have been going to for 10 years. I know a lot of these people, but it was like the whole the whole energy behind the conversations with people was different because it resonated so much that it's okay for us to sort of unpack that side of ourselves. And it doesn't have to be over on the side or hidden because it's okay for us to be human and be professionals. <laughs> I love that. And, I'm so uh, happy you know, to hear it's that. Just, it was really, it was really great. Now think about all the energy any of us would spend if we're trying to be put on a per particular persona, any way we're trying to be something we're not truly at our core or hide parts of ourselves. Think how much energy that takes. Mm -hmm. That could otherwise be spent in actually connecting with someone or doing all the technical stuff that I don't understand about your work. <laughs> yeah, it, it's very true. And I'll, I'll share two quick stories about vulnerability, I think. And then we got to go back to another story with your animals because I, I love that part. Um, but I had uh, I had a friend of mine who I've worked with many years. He listens to the podcast, so hopefully he's okay with me sharing this story, but I won't say his name. <laughs> But he's been struggling with a spouse who has really gone through some horrific health issues over the last year. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in his entire career, he has had to be a caregiver at home and still be doing his job. And it's, you know, the, the CPA industry is extremely time intensive, especially during tax season. Yep. And he was telling me the other day that his partner told him, you know, it's okay for you to tell people what you're dealing with mm. and explain that, look, things are coming in a little bit later than normal. I may be a little bit less responsive than it has, and this is why. And he was a little bit appalled at that, at the thought of opening that side of him because of the vulnerability of letting that out. But that's the realness because he is struggling with something that is so difficult. And yet he has all these clients that he's worked with for years, years and you meet 20 plus years who have no idea, no clue, and maybe put pressure on him because something's a few days late. And that I think is where, I, and I think COVID too is really beginning to break through that ice of allowing us to open that gap and realize that we are all humans and it's okay for us to share those vulnerabilities and, and open that up with each other. Um, and, you know, it, it is difficult as professionals because for some reason we feel like that makes us less professional. Right. If we open that side, well, look, here's a weakness. I have a weakness because, you know, I'm, I'm you know, taking care of my spouse or, you know, my child <laughs> you is sick and I'm say that, be out Heidi. for half a day. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt, but you can't even say it. You're trying to give the example of, well, I have this weakness because I have a wife who needs care. It doesn't even make sense. That's not a weakness, <laughs> you know? Right. Right. I, ex exactly. That's that's what's so crazy is just say, saying it out loud is like, right. that's bizarre. But in the back of our minds, we almost worry that that's the case. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's very, very interesting. And I think intriguing again, that your message I think is so valuable. So do you feel like after COVID, and since I sort of brought that up, because I think there has been a shift with, with yeah. people being more open, have you seen that as you continue to speak? You've been speaking now for 20 years. What has been that big change and shift that you've seen with people in that area? Yeah, I think that's true. COVID allowed us into each other's homes in a lot of ways with Zoom mm -hmm. or whatever platform. But um, yeah, every time I spoke virtually, I, I urged people to not not use some fake background, but if we don't get to be together physically, then when I'm speaking, I want it to feel like you're sitting in my living room with me, right? I always position myself so I have my dog behind me on the couch. So it feels like, welcome, <laughs> welcome to my home, right? And we did get to see that with each other in a really different way. And you just had to share yeah. more. People who were working from home were differently available than they were if they're in the office, which means 24 hours a day, they're right a click away, and somehow they've got to separate work yeah. and personal life. So I think it did open us some, and it sure got us in a, it fast forwarded our ability to do things virtually. So that's mm -hmm. some benefits. 
And I think you're right. I think it just did allow for a bit more vulnerability. And it will be really interesting to see now as we're moving back more to face to face, at least in some circumstances, whether that veneer comes back up or not. And I sure hope not, because I keep going back to how much energy it takes. And it's just, I don't know what to say, it's wrong thinking to think that somehow if I show you who I am, it will you will think me less than professional, right? It's been driven into our heads. Yeah. So I get why we think that. But when you when you even take that apart a little bit, it doesn't make any sense because I don't want to go to some cookie cutter financial planner, accountant or anything. I don't want someone who's just going to have this veneer where I don't know anything about you or have any idea what you think about me. I would rather know at a minimum that you're a, I don't know, Packers fan or whatever, something to allow <laughs> some point of connection because then we have the opportunity, the possibility of a relationship. And your work, like it or not, is relational. So technical as it is, the work you all do has got to be at least as much on the relationship score. Connection, belonging, all that stuff just absolutely has to be a piece of what you do. And that doesn't happen when we're all hiding behind our various masks. Because if you do that, I'm going to show up with the mask of the person who knows what they're doing financially, whether I do or not, right? I'm going to try to play my role if you're going to try to play yours. So maybe we just do away with that. <laughs> yep. That's a, that's a great point. It is. It's a great point how we tend to mirror each other almost automatically. Mm -hmm. So interesting. So so back to the dogs then. <laughs> what how how do you handle the relationship with the dogs given that I mean I don't even know how it works with a with a working dog like that but you know there's clearly they're not pets. Um I'm sure they're very different but I would imagine they still enjoy some type of affection or something. Where is the um, balance between the respect that they have to have for you and for each other in a hierarchy versus the trust that they have? Because I'm assuming that they have to have a tremendous amount of trust in you as their leader, but they also have to, to be really strong. So how, how, you know, do you, do you have a story or something like that with your dogs of how you would get to that position with one of your dogs or a whole team? Yeah, it's not hard to get that. The, I should be clear, our dog team is family. They are beloved. And we will mm. spend any amount of vet care until they're 20 years old if they ever live that long. I mean, they're just, it's not a, we aren't a working kennel in the form that we just have to keep cranking things out and have so many dogs that we can't even keep track. I mean, that's not what we do. So first and foremost, the dogs are everything. And so they are very, very loved. I, I appreciate that. I I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> yeah. And so within that framework, it isn't hard. Uh, many of them were pups that my mushing partner raised since it was there when they were born. Um, and then the ones that we do, sometimes you do get adults and it's a long working prog process to get to know them well enough to really learn what their strengths are and what their quirks are and what they need. So it's just building communication and relationship. It's, it's so similar to people. But I don't feel like it takes much to earn the alpha spot with dogs. I mean, frankly, we're feeding them every day. <laughs> I mean, they kind of know where their food's <laughs> coming from. And they're dogs. I mean, they're so loving. We don't teach them to stay down on all fours. We don't mind if they jump up because bending over to pet 30 dogs is hard on your back. So most all of them will put their paws on your shoulder and give you big kisses and hugs. And that's that's part of our every single day is lots of interaction like that. Oh, that's amazing. So how do you then deal with, if you have to, maybe if they just all grow up together, there's no issues with the interrelation between the dogs, or is there? Do you deal with any hierarchical issues? I mean, I know, I'm the only, again, I, I have some dogs. I deal with that at times, you know, with an sure. alpha dog who's here, and as young ones are growing, who's boss, who's not. How do you handle that in, in the working team with your dogs as they're all trying to sort of find their place? Yeah, there's definitely an alpha dominant male and an alpha dominant female, and that will over the time shift. Uh, all credit to my mushing partner, mm -hmm. Kathleen Anderson. Um, I I had my own team with my partner for six. We had 16 dogs for many, many years and stuff. But now I mostly work with her dogs. So she lives year round full time with these 30 dogs and 
she works with them mm. so beautifully. And her stories, we could go on forever with the dog who was part of a racing kennel that he didn't really fit the bill. And so he didn't get much attention. And then that musher ended up moving to Alaska. And this dog named Foxy was just was going to get placed somewhere. So Kathleen went and got him. And you couldn't put a leash on that dog. You wouldn't do anything. He was just a maniac. And she worked with him <laughs> for a year to get a harness on him. He couldn't even put, he would just freak wow. out and bite it and tear it off. And so it's a little, a little treat and put it close to him, a little treat. The next time the, the harness touches him, three weeks later, the harness gets mm -hmm. over his head, but that's it. You know, that kind of patience that I, she just, I don't know where she pulls that from other than a deep love for dogs. And mm -hmm. eventually we could get, so he could pull, but you had to hook up the whole team. And at the very last second, Somebody would run Foxy up the line, hook him up, and the sl sled had to take off immediately. And once he was pulling, he was okay because he got to get that crazy energy out running. And today, Foxy, I think he's eight or nine years old, and he will wait his turn, and he gets on the line. He's still crazy <laughs> barking, but he doesn't bite his harness. <laughs> he's a beautiful puller. And that took, you would, I mean, we told her she was crazy for doing that. <laughs> just some dogs, you just, <laughs> come on, some dogs you can't do this with. And she did. She does it over and again with dogs that need homes. And then she also breeds her good dogs. So she also has some really skilled dogs that will help train the others. I suppose that's the other piece to really think about is no one dog mm -hmm. or no one person can train everybody. You really want that team feel so that we have great lead dogs, so if some other dog starts to go off the trail to sniff or to pee on something, a, a good lead dog will kind of tug them back so that they stay and stay tight. You know, knock it off, kid, is what, is what they're saying to them. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's not one leader. It's one who's guiding. I mean, we're ultimately the leader, the musher, the alpha, but I'm counting on my dogs. There's no way it's just me commanding what we do. It is a, it is a exchange back and forth like, nothing I've ever experienced, the amount of trust both ways, to be out in the mm -hmm. middle of the woods somewhere and ask them to take a direction and have them do it. If they don't, I will be in an interesting spot. So the trust goes both ways for sure. <laughs> and I think, I think they must know that. It's yeah. just, it's a beautiful relationship. And they are just on the edge of wild, right? Sled dogs are Alaskan Huskies, yep. which is a mixed breed of Northern breed dogs, which simply means they love mm -hmm. to pull and they love cold weather but their DNA is almost the same as wolves, far more than any domesticated canine. So they're right on that edge of kind of wild. And their willingness to work with us, to me, is part of the real gift of being with them because they're just that close to wolfiness. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that's one thing with the dogs and the horses for me that I think is so profound in my life is the magnitude, the strength, the beauty, yeah. and the core genetic wildness of them. Yeah. And yet their willingness to work with us, you know, just to say, yes, I want to be your friend and I want to please you. And that's such a blessing. It is. Um, so from in, in your life, working in the in the wild, working with animals and doing what you're doing in, in any spectrum, what of those things do you think, what have they taught you the most about yourself? Hmm. I guess they've taught me to be present, open, original, and welcoming, actually, <laughs> if I was to sum it up quickly. <laughs> the presence necessary to connect and communicate is all about slowing it down enough to really connect, not being anything other than myself, because they can read that. I'm sure your horses can read if you're showing up off, feeling off, or just kind of not fully present. They know. And then welcoming of mm -hmm. however else someone else is in your presence. So, um, man, I could go on and on on this, I guess. But uh, they're just <laughs> such incredible teachers. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, again, I, I'm so, I think, inspired by your ability to take all of that and put it into words and create a message that is as succinct and resonates so much into corporate America, to your point, you know, and whoever told you that, that you needed to be in that space, you know, kudos to them because uh, that was a, that was a great move. In your bio, I know that you are also a poet. Mm -hmm. So do you have a, and I hate to put you on the spot, but do you have a poem that you could share with us? 
Oh, I could do that. If we can hang on for just a sec, I can pull one up. Okay, I got one. <laughs> this one is called listening, and I feel like it it ties into particularly wildly original, uh, which is living your own wild story. Sometimes all I can think to do is go outside. When people or politics press too close. When this country glaringly misaligns with what I hold dear. When time feels slippery in its passing. Sometimes all I can think to do is go outside to the long view and the leaves dripping with dew, where the wind reminds me to breathe deeply and my furrowed brow relaxes as my eyes rest on the abundant shades of green. Without any thought this year, I have found myself working in the garden barefoot. The garden shoes dedicated to permanent dirt stay in the breezeway as I step outside. I couldn't have said I needed that, but the feel of solid ground, of thick grass, the textures of earth, the welcoming soft tilled soil, all of it heals me a little bit each time, grounding me literally in this place I love, covering my feet in something natural and real, sun on my skin, dirt under my nails. This little piece of wild earth is what I get to care for and nurture, even as it responds in kind. Maybe it's the things we let ourselves do without heavy thought or too much polish that bring us back to who we are. Maybe it's as simple as saying yes to the wisdom inside that whispers to take off your shoes or to walk in the rain or whatever wild notion comes upon us when we let the soft animal of our bodies love what it loves. That is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I appreciate that so much. And, um, you know, everything you have to share touches me personally. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just so grateful for you joining. Um, to circle back around to the very beginning, you have on your website the quote that you said earlier, that wild essentially is having the courage to bring the gift of all of who you are to all of what you do. And I think it's such an incredible message. So thank you again so much for what you're doing. How can listeners get a hold of you if they want to get in touch with you to speak at their firms or to speak at an event or uh, just connect with you somehow? What would be the best way? Probably easiest just to go to the website. There's a contact page and you can see videos of my speaking and things there. So that's www.thewildinstitute.com. Okay, perfect. And are you on social media or primarily just the website? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> I'm on LinkedIn <laughs> and a tiny weeny bit on Facebook, but it's not my strength. Uh, <laughs> and somehow trying to okay. encourage people to you spend more time not... <laughs> in front of screens feels antithetical to what I speak about. So I don't do a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> I I like that. Well, the website it is, and I well, believe you have outside. a newsletter as well. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Go outside. Well, Chris, thank you so much again for being a guest. I can't wait to share this with listeners, and I hope that it resonates with people as it has with me. And uh, I believe that you'll you'll likely get some other speaking engagements because it was just fantastic to hear you speak, and uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed your message. So thank you again so much. Thank you, Heidi. It's just a pleasure. And I'm glad you're doing this. To, to broadcast this out in different forms is so important. We need to hear this message over and again because it's not what we hear in our culture. So I really applaud what you're doing. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it's something I am. It's totally my passion project, that's for sure. And, um, you know, you, you were one of the many things that continued to push me towards what can I do, even mm -hmm. if only one person listens and is just a little bit motivated to do something a little different and be more real and be more committed to themselves as a whole, holistically, physically, mentally, emotionally, um, and professionally, then that just makes me happy. That sort of feeds my soul. So I love the tax and accounting, but this is the stuff that feeds me. So uh, I respect your opinion and, and very excited to be doing this. So thank Beautiful you very thing. much. Thank you.